he always attacked. He never sat back and and was quiet. It took 10 years until I came home. And I came from prison, so I had nothing. We have to save the one. So Sheila says, we have to get rid of the doctor. Who will do it? Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the podcast in partnership with Smartcast and Najahi Events. More about those great organizations later. Right, today's episode of the podcast. If you've watched Netflix recently, you might have seen a documentary series called Wild Wild Country, where it tells the story of Indian guru Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, okay, also known as Osho, and the religious cult he developed, took from India through to the United States, and then it imploded in a very big way. One of his disciples, Jane Stork, was part of this from a very young age. She takes us on the journey to tell us her story, what happened to her, how she lived in this religious cult, how she then was sent to prison for attempted murder. Okay, not only once, but she was tried twice for two different people. My gosh, has she been through an awful lot? And she will tell us tonight what it was like living in that environment, how tough it was, how she was brainwashed, or how she just wanted to feel like she could belong. Let's cue the music and get stuck into another fascinating story on the podcast. Organizations such as Smartcast, who are solving the problem of food security in the world, have supported this podcast because they believe in the mission that I'm on. When you understand the work that they do at trying to solve the problem with this massive population growth we've been having over the years and providing a way of bringing food safely to everybody, it really is something I admire. And lastly, thank you to Najahi Events, who have been sponsoring us now on the podcast for over a year. Najahi bring motivational speakers to the region to help inspire, educate, and motivate you to achieve better success and live a better life. Join us on the show today. I am so excited to talk to you about what I think is a bit of a mysterious world, how we understand religious cults, but what the word cult actually means and the impact that it has positively and negatively, but also your journey. So as everyone knows you, this is TV show that came out that brought a huge spotlight onto what happened in Oregon back in the mid eighties. So I was a kid Well, I was born in 1970. So I was 13 years old when this was all happening. It was probably the last thing on my radar because I was more interested in playing football and trying to get the phone number of the girl that I want to chat up, I suppose. But <laughs> so, but back then, The world was obviously a different place than it is today. Everything has evolved with technology in so many different ways. And I wonder whether the same thing could be repeated today. But first of all, can you tell me, how does somebody get involved in something that to the average person seems so extreme and so kind of unusual and different? Well, I, it, it's a mystery to me too, although I understand much more today than I did way back then. Let's just say that at the time that I got involved with the Rajneesh movement, I was a young wife with two small children. My husband, a very good, decent man, had had a nervous breakdown although neither of us at that point in our lives had understood that that's what happened. We both understood that much, much later. But I was in a place where I was very disappointed in him because he wasn't being that knight in shiny armor that I thought I was marrying. And with that disappointment came a lot of resentment, a lot of anger. And I wasn't in a position in those days at all to even recognize what was going on with me. I can see it looking back now, but in those days, I didn't understand at all. And one of the things that happened a lot to me in those days, I, I would get furiously angry for the silliest things, just for nothing. 
And one day I, I just thought to myself, I don't want to feel like this. I don't want to be just blowing up for every little thing. I better go and get some counseling. So I talked to a neighbor who had already told me about a counselor who worked for the public health department in Perth in Western Australia. And I went and talked to Maureen and I said, you know, you told me about that, that guy. Um, I think it'd be good if I went and talked to him. So she told me how to contact him. I called his office. They told me he's on long service leave, but um, he's at home and you can call him at his home. He's taking calls. And that's how it all started. I didn't realize at the time, but later I understood that this person had been in India for six months and had become a follower of Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. And he then saw it as his work coming back as a therapist to West Australia to tell people about this wonderful master he had found, this guru. And that's what happened. I never got to tell that man about my anger or my problem. He, When we met, um, he introduced me to meditation. It was particular meditation that uh, the Bhagwan had developed, which was very chaotic, very loud, a lot of music. And my husband, Roger, and I um, did that meditation, and then we went back every week. And after a while, other people came, and it just happened. Um, I guess I was, all I can say is that I was vulnerable to something like that because I wasn't dealing with my life. I wasn't, I was still a child. I realize that now. I was just a child. Were you, were you, and I think about lots of people like this, it's like when you're unhappy or deeply unhappy, you sometimes say to yourself, there's got to be a better way. There has to be a, a better way of living, a better life to be had. And maybe you can't, within your kind of close-knit circles, find that better way. And so it leads us maybe to explore where we wouldn't normally explore before. Would that make sense? Yeah, totally. Also, I grew up, um, it was another generation that I grew up in. I was born just before the end of the last war, the big war. And in those days, um, children were not um, considered um, people that need to have things explained to. Children were innocent. They should just play and have a good time. And so I grew up in a family where we did not talk about problems. We just didn't. And there were there, there came a real problem in our family because my eldest sister fell deathly ill when she was 13. And it, it in the end, she was 10 months in hospital. And when she, she survived, but when she came home, she was deaf because the medication they'd given her in order to save her life had destroyed her hearing center. So here's Rosemary. She's 13 when she falls ill. She's... 14 when she comes home she's in the middle of puberty if you like she, suddenly she's deaf and she was a different person when she came home so we had a very real situation in our family but I'm quite sure it was just because of that the time period that our parents didn't discuss it with us hmm. they they managed the things. They were the adults. They managed things. They looked after us. But we had a, a kind of a wild animal in the house because that's what my sister had become. She was always running away. She was very unpredictable. Um, whereas before her illness, she had been fantastic. She was a really rock-solid older sister. <laughs> But afterwards, she wasn't. And so we didn't talk about things. And this carried over in my life so that I didn't even think to talk to my friends about what was happening with Roger and myself. I just kept everything inside. That's what I'd learned to do as a child, and I just kept doing that. And even to go to a therapist, that was huge for me. Hmm. Yeah, because that, that, yeah, that would have been... 
it would have been like that, wouldn't it? I mean, therapists are, are to a penny nowadays. Everyone's got a therapist. But back then, it was very unusual, no? Very unusual. And if, if my neighbor, who was also young, had not mentioned this person to me, saying specifically that he was very good with young people, I would never have considered it, I'm sure. Hmm. So tell me about the first time you went to these meditations. You'd never meditated before, I'm assuming. And so what, what, did, it, what did it look like? What did it feel like? And what did you do? Just to give, give me a little bit. Because I've had a go at meditation and the kind of whole traditional way of doing it is a little bit unusual for me. But what was it like for you? Well, in Bhagwan's world, there were, the meditations were very dynamic. And the meditation that was introduced to us that day was called dynamic meditation. So we were told that the music would be put on and to this music we were to um, inhale and exhale quickly through the nose for until the music changed and then we were to jump, shout, scream, whatever we felt to do, to do and then the music would change again and that was a a quiet period of stillness, just standing. And then the mu music changed again and people would lie down then and be very still. But it was was very chaotic. It was n like nothing I'd ever experienced before. I mean, in my family, we didn't shout and, and yell and <laughs> <laughs> do stuff like that. Um, so I was almost rooted to the spot. I certainly did not really participate in that dynamic meditation because I was terrified. It's like, what is this? Crazy. Afterwards, after it had finished and the couple of people who were there were talking with the therapist, I went away into the, into the bush and had a good cry. But I didn't really participate. Later, after I became a follower... I used to do that meditation every morning in the shed in the backyard. I just put on a tape and jump around, scream and yell. And to me, it became just part of life. But in the beginning, it was terrifying. How long did it take you to decide? How long did it take you before you did your first meditation before you got on a plane and you went to India? Ah, good question. I think it was about. I'm not really sure, but I would say it was about six months. Oh, that's and then, cool. uh, wow. It was happening that um, Roger and I, as I said, we were going every weekend, doing the meditation. There were other meditations also. Um, and then that therapist invited me to do a weekend workshop. It was very low key, lots of quiet meditation, uh, walking quietly, not speaking with other people, walking through the bush and um during that weekend, uh, we sat a lot in a room that had very large photos of Bhagwan, and I was just mesmerized by, by him. He had these amazing eyes. It's like I just, it, it really looked as though he was looking at you. And I think that was, it was in that weekend where I decided I want to go to India. I want to meet this person. And then I went home and I told Roger, hey, you know, we want to go to India. And he, he was happy with that. He wasn't as as um, excited about the whole thing as I was, but he was fine for us to go. So we left the, the children. We had the two children. We left them with my parents, and we went for a month to India. And in those days, in the early days in Pune, um, one could meet with Pugwan personally and talk with him. Later, that was not possible. But in the early days, that was possible. And um, when we got there, Roger also became a follower, took sannyas, as it was called. And when we became sannyasins, we were given a new name by Bhagwan. We were required to wear, in those days, orange clothes, only orange clothing. Um, and we were required to do a meditation every day. I think that was it. Yeah. So in that month that you were there, 
obviously India is a, an unusual country to go to. If you've never been there before, you've got the extremes of the wealth and the poverty from one side to the next. You've got all of the smells that are on the streets and the odors and stuff that exist there that you wouldn't normally have in Western Australia. And so what was, what was it like when you first experienced it that month? Was, uh, was it just complete, this is amazing, I'm in, or was there lots of questions? Oh, it, I was just overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed by India. I, I really wasn't prepared for it. I, and now I can see that as a European, as a white-skinned European, uh, I had this really arrogant, superior attitude. So I, I didn't meet the, pe the Indian people I met as equals. I, I was looking down on them. I was feeling sorry for the, the poor ones and and just feeling superior. So it, it, it overwhelmed me, just the, the, the sheer size of, of the, the, the country, the number of people. Um, it, I had never experienced anything like that in my life. And then, but when we got to the ashram, it was completely different. Walk through the gate, everything was quiet. People were walking very peacefully around, sitting around, laughing, talking. And I, f I felt really at that point that I had come home. This is what I've been really working towards, and I was there. And then, of course, I met Bhagwan personally, I think three, three nights later at Darshan. And um, that was it. I was in. And when I left, uh, Roger decided to stay longer. He, he, he wasn't ready to go, to go home when, when it was time to go home. <laughs> But I, I left after the four weeks. And when I left, I had a so-called leaving darshan. So I went to Bhagwan, sat at his feet. And he said to me, why are you leaving? And I said, well, I have a business and I have two children in Australia. And he said, oh, sell the business, bring the children and come and live with me. Wow. That was it. From that moment on, all I wanted to do was go to India and live there with Bhagwan. So this is been portrayed did you, i mean first of all in that documentary was it portrayed correctly yes okay good so yeah. an environment that seemed to be happy um free loving um people able to kind of truly be themselves and not be judged or measured and be loved and respected just because of who they are, not because of what they did, would that be fair to assume? Uh, yain, yes. That's that's what we all believed in. But I have to say that if you uh, criticised Bhagwan or or questioned anything, <laughs> then you were out. You were no longer being understood and loved, and so then you were out. And it happened. In India, I can remember very clearly that one of the uh, more important um, group leaders left, and he had been very, very popular. He had um, led groups there for some years, and he just left. And afterwards, Bhagwan attacked him really viciously in discourse. Um with that, uh, with the idea, I guess that oh, that's a terrible person. That's no, he's no good, and we don't want anything to do with him. Good, good riddance. So, like every, well, I think about it. Every religion, if you kind of question it and you maybe criticize any part of of any religion, you, you're not welcome, are you? No. I'm just trying to think about it. I come from a family of um, um, of Seventh-day Adventists. I, my grandparents are missionaries in the Second World War. Most of the, my dad's side of the family are still missionaries to this day. And if you question what they believe in or you're critical of it, then, you know, you're, you're never – it's not like they'll try and persuade you, convince you with interesting argument or take on your – objection or potential rejection with interest and help you overcome it they're kind of like <laughs> you don't believe you're not you're not welcome yes well that would, it was like that in the beginning of course i i was completely unaware of all of that i was just focused on the one also in that month when roger and i went for for our first visit to india uh, the one at darshan gave us 
groups to do, therapy groups to do, which were also something very new and uh, for both of us and very, in retrospect, very traumatic because um, Baguan had a, a lot of very um, well-known therapists who came from America, from England, from Holland, and they led a, a very intensive therapy group program. So there were all kinds of groups going on, and uh, Bhagwan assigned groups to both Roger and myself. Um, so it was all all part of really becoming more and more deeply involved. And so we didn't see, or I definitely didn't see, anything that would in any way rattle my, my ideas about who this person was and that I was supposed to be there and that how lucky I was. I'd, I'd found a great master. And, and for me, I, that was just the most fantastic thing in the world. Hmm. There must have been a lot of warmth at that time. And obviously seeing your husband at that time as well, he must have been in a better headspace, feeling better about himself rather than where, where he was before in Australia. So that must have been encouraging and comforting too. Yes, I think so. And also, um, let's remember that when you're in the ashram, everybody thinks the same way as you do. Everybody thinks for one is fantastic. Every, that's all they're interested in. Um what groups they're doing or what Bhagwan is saying and and so you're in a in a bubble it's a special bubble where you feel really as though you belong everybody's yeah. wearing orange clothes so you know you belong and everybody's calling you by your new name whereas at home of course most people, most people especially my family they just laugh and they said, well, that's all right, but you're our Janie. You know? so, <laughs> and there was no question that they were going to use that new name. But in the Ashram, everybody used it. And so it was really a feeling of belonging, and it, it was a nice feeling. Now, you you settle in, you get to do some daily tasks and some work and stuff. And so I remember in the TV show that your your first job was quite an acclaimed position, quite a – quite an extravagant and um, regal position to hold within the organization. So was it, was just correct me if I'm wrong, were you doing something with cleaning toilets? That's exactly what I was doing. Not on that first trip. The first trip, as I say, I went back after a month, but mm -hmm. then um, eventually Roger and I, we really, we got rid of everything we owned in Australia. We gave it away, sold it. We packed up a few belongings and our children and we moved permanently to India. We said goodbye to all our friends. It's like, bye, you know, we're, we're off. We're not coming back. And that was when uh, we we settled in and we were given jobs. And my job was in, indeed to clean toilets. And I must confess that when I was told that that was my job, I was not happy. I was like, you mean I came all the way to India to clean toilets? But, you know, I was in the Buddha field and so... I pushed all that aside. And for one year, for a whole year, I cleaned toilets in the ashram. Yeah. I suppose when everyone's, I want to tell you what, if you're working in a group of people and you're all using toilets, then it's probably one of the most important jobs anyway, isn't it? But, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yeah, had a had a position of, uh, uh, of definitely authority. What do they call these people? There was a guy I met one day. I said, what do you do for a living? He says, I'm a vision technician. I was like, wow, well, that sounds really interesting. What's that? He said, I'm a window cleaner. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Yeah, right. <clears throat> no, I, and I clean toilets very well. I took it seriously. Yeah. And so, I did the job. Yeah. Talk to me about the kids and how they settled in because that must have been a big change for them and, again, a whole world that they've never experienced before. Was that tough? And, and they always told me afterwards that those early years they loved. They they just were running free. There was a, a school, an ashram school, but they just – Nobody was very serious about it. So the kids basically ran free. There were other children also, and they did what they wanted to do. And at that point, Roger and I and the family, the kids, we were all still together, and we were sharing a room together. So we always met in the evening, and, and we ate in the evening together, and we slept in the same room. But at some point, I think uh, maybe we had been there for a year or more, um, I decided in my fervor 
that more devotion was required, and that would mean um, that we should that Roger and I should split up because families had no place in the commune. But one spoke um, very often about how marriage was a was an old fashioned idea that had nothing to do with with spirituality and that everybody should be free to be with whoever they want um, and nobody should feel jealousy or in, or anger or any of that. And I am, I myself was not sexually promiscuous just because of who I was, the way I was, I was born a Catholic, you know, okay. and by nuns. <laughs> it was just who I was. Um, but I thought it was time to make the next commitment which was to basically uh, separate from my husband. And I went to the office. Even today, I, I can't believe, but I gave them my engagement ring and my wedding ring that Roger, who was a geologist, had panned the gold for himself. And I gave it to the uh, people in the office and said, that was my gift of book one that should be used to make jewelry for him. And um, I wanted to, to have a separate room. Well, what happened then was that not only were Roger and I given separate space, but the children also. They, they had never been separate from each other since, since Kylie was born. And suddenly they were also put in separate accommodation. And they both told me later, in, in later years, that that was the most traumatic thing for them because before when they were running free every day they knew they had a home base mm. and they knew where to find Roger and I but from that day on they they were kind of cut loose and they they always felt very insecure and, so and so where, where did they where did they sleep um, at that time uh, in Corrigan Park, it wasn't in the ashram itself. The ashram itself was quite small, but it was in a property uh, very close by. And bamboo huts had been built around the edge of a big property. And we were all assigned places in bamboo huts with sharing with somebody else. So... In my hut, there was an older man who I didn't know who slept at one end and I slept at the other. And the children were with, also with adults, but foreigners, adults they didn't know. Wow, that must have been really, really difficult when you're a kid, you know, going home to mum and dad every evening and even going home to one mum or, or, or one yeah, dad. It was, been, it, but... the, when I look back, I, I really shudder at the things that my blind devotion uh, did to my children. It's just... It, it, oh. How old were they when, they when that was happening? Now, let me see. When we went there, Kylie was six and Peter was going on for nine. So it must have been a year later, so seven and ten, let's say. So young. And they remember everything at that age as well. Yes. And later on, <clears throat> um, a bit later on, they built a, a children's hut was built. Um, in the ashram, no, on one on a property close to the ashram, and all the children of people who worked in the ashram then were put to to live in that hut. So then they were living all children together. But it was uh, for uh, for both of my children. It was it was a nightmare. From then on, it was a nightmare. And how long then did it take you before you decided to go to America? What was the time period that you were in India before you went to the States? Oh, well, I, we, were, we were all of us four years in India, and it was Bhagwan who one day. Now, Bhagwan, you must understand, he lived in the ashram. It was a very small property, I think five, five acres with a big wall around it. And his own place had a wall around it where he lived. And he only came out once a day in the morning to give discourse, it was maybe a hundred meters from his house to give discourse and then back again. He never went anywhere. He did not go anywhere. And one day after we'd been there for four years, 
he was driven out of the, the front gate. It was just unbelievable. Nobody knew where he was going. Most people didn't even know he had gone. I happened to see the car with him in it go through the front gate. But no, we, nobody was told where he was or what was happening. Um, and at first it was said, well, he has health problems. Um, he'll be back. But after a little while, uh, people were told, well, you should go back to your home country and wait and see. And because of who I was and because of um, this blind devotion that I had to book one, I, like the child I was, decided I'm not going anywhere. I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm waiting for him to come back. I, I'll wait. And I was somehow in, I had this childish thinking that, oh, if, if I just stay here, he'll come back. I just have to be patient. And eventually, after some months, well, the whole ashram was, well, apart from the stone buildings, everything else was taken apart, taken away, sold, got rid of. And I was still there. And one day I was called in and I was told to buy a ticket to America and um, to buy jeans and orange, of course, and Western clothes, and I was to take a flight to America. And that's where I really understood that that's where Bhagwan was there. And the day after I arrived, Bhagwan came to the community in Oregon, which was just beginning. He came there very early on. Where did the money come from for all of this? Oh, good question. The, the money came from his followers. There were the odd, very rich ones who donated freely, but by far the most of the money came from Bhagwan's followers who were told after he went to America. Of course, in India, the money came from the therapy groups. It was a very big business. I worked in the booking office in in Pune after, after cleaning toilets. Um, and it was a huge business. That was a great source of income. In America, um, sannyasins, as they were called, sannyasins all over the world were told to create businesses and to um, follow the, the same pattern that was followed in the ashram, which was people worked for room and board and their clothing, but they were not paid. And so hundreds, thousands of sannyasins all over the world, in Australia, in Europe, in America, they, they opened restaurants and discos. And they worked the same way as if they were in the ashram. And you can make a lot of money when you don't have to pay your workers. And that money was all channeled to America. So all of these businesses outside of the communes were running as operating businesses just to help keep funding the coal. Yes. Yes. And did anyone look at the extravagance of the Rolls Royces and the jets and whatnot and say, this is a bit cheeky, this is a bit of a liberty, or was everyone just in celebration of that? Well, you know, Bhagwan had a very, <laughs> a bit, he was a professor of psychology before he became a guru. And he had a very good understanding of human psychology. And so if people, occasionally somebody, someone would address a question to him, you, you would have to write your question, send it to him. And then he would always present it so that, well, this is just a, this is just a technique I have to show you how small-minded you are, how petty, how jealous, and so on and so forth. I don't need these cars, you know, my people want to give them to me, and so on and so forth. So that at least among his followers, um, it was a kind of a joke. The, the, Russian, the, the Rolls Royces were a joke. But by the time um, everything collapsed there in Oregon, he had 93 Rolls Royces. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, Okay. What was the, when you went across to Oregon, I'm going to talk to you about this in quite a bit of detail, but when you went across, just to give me some, some scale here, 
What was the at, at its at its peak? What was the highest population on the ranch? Oh, I don't really, I can't really tell you. I think it was four thousand. But what would happen is once a year. Oh, by the way, it just. So, so you can get an idea of the size of the operation. The land that was bought there in Oregon, in central Oregon, was 126 square miles. It was huge. It was I mean, really huge. That is, I mean, I want to try and put this into perspective. I don't know if you've ever been asked this question before, but it's like, how big is 126 square miles? That's, I mean, I mean, it's... I'm just trying to give it perspective. Is it is it like a county in the UK? I mean, I know Oregon's kind of barren and bleak in some areas and whatnot, because it's the, a lot of her Oregon's the middle of nowhere. And just just that, to call it a ranch is ridiculous, isn't it? it? To even call it a farm is ridiculous. I think the only way that you'd compare it is if you were to understand what, um, what Australians think a farm is. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. Because... <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yeah. And it, was, it was in America and it was high desert country. So previously it, it had been a cattle ranch and you needed that much in order to be able to have enough cattle to, to make a living. But it was a huge property and we set about building a city there. Um, and I think that this, the population, the permanent population was about 4,000 at its peak. But once <clears> a year, there was a so-called Master's Day celebration uh, where people would come from all over the world and stay for a week or two weeks. Special accommodation was set up and so on and so forth. And uh, at the last festival in 1985, there were 15,000 visitors. On wow. Top of, on top of the so, so how long, I mean, I want to talk to you about antelope because I think that's comedy gold, some of that. You know, it reminds me, it reminds me of how some people think about, you know, outsiders, no matter where they're from. You know, I remember when I was, when I was in, in Nigeria as a kid, I, I was the white kid, you know, I was the kid that, that stuck out. Yeah. I, I, I was the minority and it, it, it came with some fascination, but also, an aspect of it came with, you know, there was an element of something sinister is probably too strong a word, but there was a, you know, an unease about me from some people. So I do remember that when I was a kid. So how long did it take to, to, to get the project constructed? Was it a year's worth of construction, two years? What was it? No, it was, it was at least two years, probably three before everything was in place. Um, I spent the first year in Antelope in a, a mobile trailer because that was where the phone was. Um, and Sheila would come down every day, take phone calls, ordering things and so on and so forth. Everybody came to use the phones in Antelope. Mm. But it took, I, it took a good three years to build the property in uh, the, the city on what had been the Big Muddy Ranch. Okay, so so for people that haven't seen the TV show, you guys are watching it right now saying, hold on a minute, what's this all about? I need to get on Netflix straight away. Look, you've got eight hours or seven or seven and a half, eight hours worth of, of, of TV documentary to consume. I urge you to watch all of it, every single one of you. It's thoroughly enjoying. It's in some parts shocking. In other parts, you feel like you're missing out and you wish you'd have been there yourself. And and you have some empathy for some, and maybe the story twists and turns along the way as you start to, to get through it. But that there was a town called Antelope, and this town had a population of 40 people. So again, we wouldn't call it a town in the UK. It wouldn't even be called a hamlet. It would be less than that. And this town essentially was the closest um, uh, congregation of people or community to the ranch. And they weren't happy, were they? No. Well, you, I think it's understandable. They lived in a very quiet, little tiny town, you know. Life went on in a, in a very ordered fashion. And all of a sudden, all these people wearing red clothes, because by now it had moved from orange to red. So people wearing red clothes were just pouring through town and going down to the ranch. And then uh, not long after that, then came mobile homes on trailers going down the whole time, truckloads of building equipment, food, all kinds of things. All of a sudden, there was all this activity and it was 
all around these people dressed in red and they saw red. They saw red for sure. And I, yeah, I, part of me is like set in their ways. Obviously there's uh, other people. I would have thought when something like that happened, there'd be a few people in the community that would be sitting thinking, Oh, opportunity here. There's people I can sell more goods and I can sell more stuff. Was there any of that or was it just blanket? Everybody was negative towards you. Oh, in, in Antelope, I think everybody was negative. But uh, in in Oregon, uh, were a lot of business people who did take advantage and who did um, do very good business with the ranch. So it wasn't that everybody was against um, what was happening down there. But the people, certain people in Oregon formed themselves into a group called the Thousand Friends of Oregon. And they made it their job to prevent a city being built on land that had been uh, previously been agricultural. It was zoned agricultural. So they they really fought against that zoning being changed. But there were, as I say, there were lots of business people who were very happy that we came. Tell me about your relationship with Sheila. So I really got to know, actually it was Sheila who gave me the job to be a cleaner in, in, in <laughs> India. But I really got to know Sheila in that first year in Antelope because she came every day to use the phones and um, I'd make her cups of tea and snacks and, and we just got to know each other. And I can say today that what was very attractive to me was that this woman who spent time every day with Bhagwan, was very close to him, knew what he was saying, what he was thinking. And it was super attractive to me that I had access to her, that I could hang out with her. Mm. Whereas Bhagwan, especially in, in Oregon, he was no longer accessible. He lived in a house in a valley, uh, far removed. You didn't see him. You just didn't see him. And so for me, Sheila became like a uh, like a mini guru for me. Mm -hmm. And it grew from there. And again, was you just in that, that headspace of blind faith with everything Bhagwan related? And so so yes. she she was just all good too, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everything she did was fine with me. Yeah. I I mean you must look back on that right now and over the years and sit and think, you know, what, what was I thinking from time to time? You must have thought, how did well, I... I? I can tell you today I wasn't thinking. I thought I was really like, I, I was wide awake. I was doing great stuff. I was going to save the world because Bhagwan was building a Buddha field. It's going to change the whole energy and save mankind. I mean, really heady stuff. And I was totally into that. Um. But today, I just think, oh, how, how, how absurd. I really, when I look back at my life, I often think I was fast asleep and dreaming until I was maybe 40. Just and, fast, like a fairy story. And other people all around you were in the same space and the same state. Yes. I think that's an important point. Because when everybody around you is going along with what's happening and not questioning, um, then it's easy for everyone to to just stay on track. It's 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 comforting actually to have everybody. and then then very quickly everybody who's not like you, who's not wearing red and who's not uh, adoring this guru, is to be pitied and that you don't need to listen to them because they don't know what they're talking about anyway. We know what's going on. I mean, I grew up as a Catholic and I learned when I was at convent school that we had the truth. Well, when I was at Rajneeshi, we had the truth. <laughs> and I think we all, we all thought the same. Blind faith. Yeah. Does that make you look at religion differently now? Yes, definitely. And do you see any good that comes from religion? Um, that's also a good question because I do know people. I have one of my sisters, for example, who takes a lot of comfort from her religion. 
she doesn't um, hurt people or she, she definitely consciously tries to be good to people, to do things right. And then I can't criticize that. I think, okay. But we're in very different places. She stayed home uh, all those years. She never traveled. She didn't go follow some crazy guru or end up in prison or any of that. So I think it's okay. But we'll come on to this bit about prison in a minute. But isn't every religion praying to some form of God? alive or dead or some form of book or story or something that enables the other people that believe the same to motivate and inspire the others within the group to keep believing regardless whether it's nonsense or not yes and I, I mean i personally i feel personally i feel that all religion is just a power game you have People who rise to the top, who make the rules, who say this is how it is and you have to follow them. And then there are the people, in many cases, very innocent, but always childlike, I think, mm. who then happily follow that. I, I really feel, when I look at my own story, I think it's a childish need we have to follow someone, to have a God, a a big daddy figure who tells us what to do. When we finally grow up, which we hope we all do, we don't need that anymore. Yeah, I'm not sure everybody does, though. I think a lot of people find, like you did, they find some element of safety, some certainty, some peace, uh, some sense of belonging. I think that's really important as well. We need to feel like we belong um to, to whatever whatever that group may be to feel like we belong yeah. and and you know, the proof of that is in how the gang culture works in america and all over the world actually when they when they yeah. bring bring these kids into gangs and make them feel that they belong and they become a, a gang yeah. member but i don't see there being so much difference apart from that's for evil as opposed well, to well, there isn't because they they don't they don't question what the gang is doing mm. they're also they, they become an active part of it they support it mm. and in that regard it's absolutely the same yeah. Belonging, I think, is a really basic human need. Mm, yes, absolutely. Significance, belonging, okay, love, appreciation, acceptance, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Okay, so let's carry on painting the picture because uh, there'll be lots of people who are probably watching this or listening on their phone right now while they're, uh, well, not right now, when it comes to be, be released along with the, the TV show being on Netflix. So there's this huge ranch. You've gone about starting to build it. You've basically pissed off the local community because you've gone in there, you know, all guns are blazing, not literally at that point, but, you know, banging the drums, playing the trumpets. And they're like, what on earth is going on here? So then you're trying to find a way to, 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 to get on and just do what you want to do and to be left alone, essentially, on that plot of land so that you can farm it, live in it, celebrate in it, whatever it may be. And people didn't like that. No, they didn't. And so, and they put all kinds of um, difficulties in the way. I mean, it, it, there were a lot of court cases filed to stop the city being built. And so at some point, one who was always an instigator and never a mediator said, okay, we're going to take over the town of Antelope. And he sent sannyasins to live in the town uh, first of all, they um, uh, they voted themselves onto the school board so that essentially the, the school became a Rajneeshi school. The children were sent to Antelope to live, to go to the school, and um, ultimately Rajneeshis voted themselves to the, into the town council so that they were running the town. That pissed off not only naturally the people living in the Antelope, but a lot, a lot, a lot of other people too. So there's a book by Dale Carnegie called How to Win Friends and Influence People. None of that was read then, I'm assuming. <laughs> what I said, the one was no mediator. He always took, um, he always attacked. He never sat back and... And was quiet. And you must understand that Bhagwan was running everything. 
he was telling Sheila every day what to do, how to do it. He watched her TV appearances. Uh, she read him newspaper articles. He would tell her where she could have been ruder, tougher, louder, how she was to do it next time. And he was literally running every single thing that was happening. He made all the decisions. The money came from his followers. There were the odd, very rich ones who donated freely, but by far the most of the money came from Bhagwan's followers. Yeah, a bit of a megalomaniac type of character, but you, she, she was being told all of the time what to do, what to say, how to say it, so that uh, she could get the outcome that Bhagwan was looking for. That's right. And, I mean, of course she has her own particular character. Sure. Um, and she she relished it. She she relished the job she had. She she really enjoyed it. But the bottom line is she was doing what Bhagwan told her to do. I kind of liked this guy at first. When I first started watching, I kind of liked the guy. I was like, at first I was thinking, I understand why people like him. There's some positive here. But when you hear you explaining that in that way, I kind of think, you you had an agenda, mate. You're you're you weren't you weren't good at all. There was there was definitely a um, was it greed? Was it power? I don't know. Was the, the there's something in there that took him from being a guy that was perceived and seen as actually a really uplifting, inspiring, and encouraging character to then the other side of someone that's not. Would that be fair? Yes. And I I don't know. Again, each of us has our own character that we develop as from the time we're born, as we grow up according to our environment, our parents, and, and so on. Hmm. I don't believe that the one set out to be a great guru. I think it was a, a something that evolved. And another thing that changed dramatically with Bhagwan is that in India, he always presented himself at discourse in the mornings and earlier on at Dashan um, in a very austere white robe. He looked 100% the part of a sage. In America, we, weren't, we were hardly there. And he started um, having, he had his own seamstresses and they started creating fantastic robes for him. And silks and satins, velvets, amazing robes, and every day a different one. Um, I, I sometimes think he got infected by, by, by something in America, so he became more like a rock star than a guru. Maybe he'd be secretly been uh, shipped in lots of editions of Vogue for him to read and get ideas from. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's that kind of that. There's that behavior, isn't it? It's kind of like you go from that person that's you, you really believe you're doing something good and you want to change society to that 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 self belief you start having. Like I'm the man. I'm the man. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm bag one. I am the dude. Look at me. And there's a an, an element of that. And I think in most people, if they get into get into a position like that. Okay, let's talk about when things started to get really sinister because there've been some challenges along the way. But you getting involved with having to i don't want to call it murder because it doesn't seem like murder but you, you you wanted to take on someone else's life i thought when i was going to kill that person that person was bhagwan's doctor he was also a rajneeshi uh, he lived in bhagwan's house with him over the the four years that we were in oregon um they had developed, apart from the outside conflicts with the people in Antelope and and in Oregon, they developed within the community real conflicts between people who were close to Baguan. There was, and it developed into two factions. There was there were the people who lived in Baguan's house and and took care of Bhagwan, and there were the people who lived in Sheila's house. And uh, there, there was real conflict between the two. Now, Bhagwan's doctor lived 
in Bhagwan's house, he was his doctor. At some point, Sheila, Sheila had always felt that this doctor was completely um, irresponsible and didn't do a good job. And so at some point, she used that as an excuse to herself, I think, to organize to have Bhagwan's rooms wiretapped, without his knowledge, of course. So from that day on, she could hear what was being said. And one day, it was in, um, uh, I think it was in early 1985, um, she, she called me and she told me I was to listen to a tape. And in the tape, one was asking his doctor, how can you induce death um, in a dignified, painless way. And the doctor outlined there were three things that you would need. He outlined what they were and how they were to be used. And Bhagwan told him to order enough of those medications for three people. He did. That was, we know that from the wiretap. And when the, those medications arrived, he secreted them somewhere in the garden. What happened later was that on the evening of the 5th of July, 1985, it was Master's Day celebration, thousands of people there. And the following day, the 6th of July was Master's Day. And on the evening before, um, I was called to Sheila's um, house along with 19 or 20 other people. And when we were all together, Sheila said, tomorrow the doctor is going to administer the, the medicines to Bhagwan and he will die. Bhagwan had already said that he would die on Master's Day, but he didn't say which Master's Day. And there was no discussion. When I think back, nobody asked, how do you know that? Or uh, are you sure? Or, but doesn't want to, doesn't but one want to die if he's asking his doctor to do that? No, we didn't. It's like, oh my God, we have to save but one. So Sheila says, we have to get rid of the doctor. Who will do it? And but first, nobody says anything. And then I say, I will do it. And the next morning, during the, in the middle of the Master's Day celebration, Bhagwan sitting up the front, music, people um, singing, swaying, and, and being ecstatic in the presence of their master, I attacked that doctor with a syringe full of adrenaline, which I thought was going to kill him. Later, I found that it would never have killed him because um, it has to be, if adrenaline like that injected into a muscle is not going to do anything except give him a fright. But it was my intention to kill him. And I'm so grateful today that the nurse who gave me that syringe full of adrenaline um, gave, that, gave that to me and not something else. Did she give that on purpose or by accident? I've never asked her. But I like to think she did it on purpose. I'm going to think that too, because I think that's a nicer way to think about it. So you've sat there with Sheila. We've got to get rid of this guy. He's going to kill Bagwan. You have then been essentially volunteered to do it because you were quite a good shot as well, apparently, weren't you? And that, was, it, that was a rumour on the ranch. Oh, really? Okay. But the fact that you took that on, I mean, my gosh, I, I'm talking to you now and I'm just thinking, where was your head? What were you thinking at that time? What, was, what were you believing at that time that you could get so, so convincingly seduced into something that could compromise your life forever and do it without thinking too much about it? Yeah. It, I thought that in saving, I believed I would be saving Bhagwan's life. Yeah. I never thought beyond that. I never thought beyond that. What were the consequences? What would happen? That I would kill a person? I never thought I was going to save Bhagwan's life, whether he wanted it or not. And in doing so, I was going to save 
the world. It wasn't until many, many, many years later when I was preparing to go to court in America that I realized I was trying to save my world because my world was Bhagwan and his community. Hmm. And I was telling myself some another story. You're a lovely lady. I just can't think of you thinking like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> You'd have to forgive me. It's, um... Well, you know, I can hardly believe it myself today. I really look back and I can hardly believe it myself. You were going to kill, you were going to kill someone. Yes. You, you literally unemotional. I need to, it, it reminds me of other people that do things that, that this is, you know, saving Bhagwan is the priority. So you can't, you can't see, imagine anything else. It's just like, right, got to get in, got to save Bhagwan. There's no consequences that are in the brain at that time. There's no, there's no complications either. It's like, well, this is a bit of a clean and shut case here. I'm not letting Bhagwan go. Okay. I better, I better get rid of this guy. Whoa, gosh. When that injection that you put in him didn't work, what did you feel the next day? Well, Bhagwan was still alive. I knew that. Yeah. Um, because the doctor was taken to hospital off off the the ranch into hospital. He didn't tell his treating doctors what had happened. He didn't tell his doctors in the hospital that I had attacked him with a syringe with something in it. He didn't tell them. But he was in hospital for a few days. And the next day I I, I was in shock. I was definitely in shock because I knew in that moment that I had crossed a line that was never to be crossed. And it was, for me, the beginning of the end. I knew I had to leave. I knew I had to leave Bhagwan. I knew I didn't understand everything, but I knew I had gone too far and I knew... I had to leave. It, I just had to leave. And it was this, this feeling of knowing that I had overstepped the line. And it meant I had to leave everything, the community, but one, I had to go away from there where I had overstepped the line. That was what filled me for the next six weeks until I actually left. Just the thought of leaving was so impossible. But you know, I I it, it reminds me of, and I'm going to use a really poor example here. So forgive the example. There was a lady in the UK that was incredibly overweight and she was sat outside a McDonald's restaurant eating her burgers as usual and two kids cycled past and threw their burgers through the window at her and they said to her there you go fat so have some of that too and in that moment she said everything changed in my life in that very moment I just stopped and I went never again I don't know what happened but my brain completely reset in that moment it literally went to a massive wake-up call in a flash and then she went on to lose, I can't remember the exact weight, but she lost like 50 kilos and, and, and became simmer of the year. And I, I, I use that as an example because it's like there, there are places we go to where we're quite oblivious and then all of a sudden it's like never again. A simple example is when you're in the car and you have a very close call, someone nearly crashes into you or you nearly crash into them and all of a sudden you go, whoa, Better concentrate a bit more here. Stop, 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 stop. Take a breather. This is not good, okay? So it's like change, change the pattern. So did you talk to the doctor after you did it? No. Okay, so you never spoke to him. You knew something had to change. Good, okay, so that's great. There's, there was a moment that you were like, this is nuts, yeah? Yes, really. I just knew. I mean, I, I knew that. I grew up with that, that you don't kill people. Thou shalt not kill yeah, but there's other rules that you grew up with as well that you ignored as well. So, mm. But that one somehow, it, because now we're talking about life, it, 
it shook me awake. Not wide awake, but awake enough to know I have to leave here. Who did you, when, when you felt that, who did you then tell? I didn't tell anybody. So you kept it inside? Yes. And you sat thinking to yourself, right, and how, how old were your children at this point? Um, at this time, uh, Kylie must be 14 and P- Peter must be so 16, going on 17. Okay, so they're a bit older, they're a bit, bit, bit wiser. They're still there on the commune with you. So then do you spend the next few weeks thinking about how you're going to get out? Well, something happened because alongside the internal conflict, which came to a head when I tried to kill the one doctor, the outside conflict had also developed to a point where meetings were being held in Sheila's bedroom, which was also her office, um, where plans were being made to also kill other people who were making trouble. And after I had attacked the one's doctor, a few days later, Sheila had a few people in her bedroom and the name of one of the people who was on the list to be murdered came up and a woman who was very close to Sheila had a just complete, complete nervous breakdown. She, she threw herself on the floor. She couldn't bear to hear another word about killing people. It had to stop and so on. And I wasn't in the room at the time, but Sheila called me and said, talk to her. She was just a puddle on the floor and wailing. I can't hear any more about killing people. I won't hear it. It's got to stop. And I told her, don't worry. Nobody's going to kill anybody, least of all me. This is not happening. It's over now. And she actually, she stopped crying. She looked at me. She wasn't sure if I was just making it up. But it was the first time I was able to say, no, it's finished now. This whole madness, it's finished. I didn't say I was leaving, but I did say there will never be any more. And actually other people in the room were nodding and and agreeing that, Yes, we, we've gone too far now. So you say six weeks later you get on a plane? Yes. I have to also say that Sheila was the catalyst, strangely enough. I came back from a court appointment one evening. She was in her room, a lot of people, some people crying, and she looks at me and she said, I'm leaving. And I knew in that moment, if she can leave, I can leave. And I was on a plane the next day. And you went to Germany? Yes. Why Germany? Because Germany was a country where people of different nationalities could all um, meet up and be there for th- without needing a visa for three months. I mean, they could come and stay for three months before they needed to get a visa. Also, I had no money at that point. By that time, uh, Roger and I had given all our money to the community and it was a German sannyasin who paid for my fare. And also my daughter decided to come with me and my son decided to stay there with his dad. So uh, it was a German sannyasin who paid for our tickets so that we could come to Germany. And in Germany, the plan was that people who were leaving um, would meet up because when Sheila said she was leaving, a group of about 20 people uh, also left. What was it like when you got to Germany? How did you feel? It was terrible. It was, it was just terrible because I hadn't lived in the real world for eight going on nine years. I had been just in my, my orange red bubble and I'd left Baguan, which was just impossible. That for me, that was just like something really impossible. And at the same time, when Sheila left, Bhagwan started attacking her and making public all kinds of things that, that he had instigated, but which had happened behind the scenes. And right off the bat, he made public at discourse that I had tried to kill his doctor. So not only did we have, did I have, but all of us 
this completely new situation where we'd left the one and we were in a strange land. I didn't speak the language, but that was by by the by. But also, Bhagwan was attacking us on a daily basis. Um, it was terrifying. And there were, there were two people I, I remember in our group. They just were completely catatonic. They couldn't get off their beds. They just lay in bed or on the bed looking, staring at the ceiling and not able to speak or cry or laugh or do anything. We were all in, in a... A really terrible state. Oh. How long after getting to Germany did it all fall apart in Oregon? How much longer were they there for, before it started to collapse? It, um, I think we were in Germany for, I'm not quite sure if it was four weeks or six weeks. I can't remember anymore. But it, it, it happened simultaneously because at the point in Oregon, well, first of all, Bhagwan was on a daily basis at discourse, uh, telling, attacking Sheila and people who had left with her, uh, telling all kinds of stories. Some of them were true, like my attack on his doctor. Some of them were half true. Uh, some of them were completely made up, absolutely made up. But they were all horrible, you know. And he called us, uh, he called the group around Sheila like Hitler and so on and so forth. He's, of course, what he was doing was turning his followers there against us, really turning them against us, so that other people wouldn't get the same idea that, oh, they can all leave or we can leave too. But in, in attacking us, he also invited law enforcement officers to come to the community. And, of course, they just didn't stop at looking at what Sheila had done they started looking at the whole community because they'd been wanting to do that for a long time. They, they had suspected for a long time that there were, for example, a lot of fake marriages between Americans and non-Americans and things like that. And but one kept pouring fuel on the fire. And one of the things that he said, which was really, really undid him, was he said that he never wanted a religion. And he told his sannyasins, to burn Sheila's religious garments that she had worn when she was representing the church and to burn the books of Rajneeshism, which he had dictated to Sheila four years earlier in order to form a religion so that he could get a visa as a religious leader. But in his rage at Sheila leaving, I think much less that the others of us left, but that Sheila left, he he went so far as to say, I never wanted a religion, burn everything that has to do with it. And of course, that was it. His visa was gone. And he left in private plane with his doctor and his companion, a few people, and they stopped to refuel somewhere in America and they were all arrested. At the same time in Germany, at exactly the same time, Policemen came to the, the holiday place that we were all in, in Germany, in the Black Forest, and arrested Sheila and Sheila's nurse and myself for the attempted murder of Bhagwan's doctor. So we were, we were then um, sent back to America, extradited to America. By the time we got there three months after our arrest, Guan and uh, all his people had already left, long since left. Um, but once Sheila and, and her nurse were in America, Sheila was then charged with many more wiretapping, all kinds of things, um, immigration fraud, all kind of, you name it. And... Um, so when you were when you were charged in in Germany, though, they didn't extradite you straight away. No, they they have to look and see if the charges meet the requirements of the extradition treaty because countries have extradition treaties mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. And in Germany, it, it's very simple. It just says that if the charge has a um, has a potential um, imprisonment time of more than a year, then the person can be extradited. And that was definitely the case in an attempted murder charge. So, so it didn't take very. I think it took three months. 
spent my first Christmas in Germany in prison. How about how long were you in, how long were you in prison in Germany for? Three months. Three months. That's your first experience of prison. And, yes, and I have to say that apart from the circumstances, it was it was could be considered pleasant because. At that time, anyway, I don't know what it's like now, but it was a small prison. It was just for women who were awaiting trial or extradition. And so it never had more than 20, 24 women at any one time. And it was very clean. Everything was clean. Everything we were provided to wear, to put on our beds, to wash with, everything was very clean and tidy. And the guards were were very pleasant they were good people they didn't abuse us in any way hmm. okay that's good to know so how were you were you in prison how long how, i've just i've got the dates right here let's make sure i've got them right um bug one died when oh much later mm, maybe I'm, I'm not sure but i think it was two years later okay fine so he's still alive you know he's left the states well he didn't he, he was in the states he then eventually left went back to india your 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 son then became very sick didn't he well that was much much later in those days that was in, now we were extradited sheila and her nurse and i were extradited in 1985 uh, well actually 1986 early 1986 we were extradited back to america we did plea bargains and we were sentenced um and I served um, almost two years in prison in America before I was released. Um, that was a nightmare experience, no matter whichever way you look at it. Then I went back to Australia for a little while. I came back to Germany, and I had a very, I had a very big legal bill, as you can imagine. And in Germany, there were still a couple of people from the original group who had left. And one of them, who was an accountant, had borrowed money for our legal fees, and she had also used the money to buy a juice bar and a coffee shop. And she asked me to come back to Germany to run the juice bar so that I could repay my debt. And that's what I did. And in that juice bar, I, it was very close to the university, and I met my now husband. We have now been married for 32 years. <laughs> George was lecturing at the university and I was desperately trying to run a juice bar without really knowing German. Um, and he was very helpful in <laughs> teaching <laughs> the German I needed to know in order to run a juice bar. Um, we married um, in 1990 we married and a month later I was arrested again. I was arrested on the charge of having been part of a conspiracy to murder the U.S. Attorney General for Oregon, Mr. Turner. And um, again, I was put in extradition custody, but this time the High Court who had extradited me five years earlier recognised my name. And they recognized the story around the charge. So they, uh, their chief justice was displeased. He couldn't understand why were they coming again? They, we said to her once, why didn't you take care of things there? So they did a very, very unusual thing. First, they asked the Americans for clarification. Why didn't you take care of things then? Uh, and so on and so forth. And they got the answers, but they still weren't satisfied. So they did a very, very unusual thing in an extradition case. They decided to do their own investigation. Mm -hmm. Now, they were not trying the case. Mm -hmm. They just wanted to know what happened, what was this all about. And part of that was that I was invited from my prison cell to, to the, the high court to answer questions. And my lawyer said to me, now this is really dangerous. You're gonna say stuff, they're gonna write it down, they're gonna send it to America. And if in the end they decide 
that you have to be extradited, then you, you're lost. And I didn't have to think about it very long, but I said to him, if I don't talk to them, how will they know? So I talked to them. Long story short, six months later, they denied the extradition. And it was denied because in Germany, there is a clause to conspiracy cases that says, if a person withdraws from a conspiracy, even if the conspiracy goes ahead, then they are not liable. And so uh, the extradition was denied on the basis that I had been part of the conspiracy, but that I, ha that I had withdrawn and that while I had been chosen to be the trigger woman and I had withdrawn, then the whole conspiracy had fallen apart and nothing had ever happened to Mr. Turner. However, the Americans um, didn't accept that they, they had to accept it for Germany. So I was only safe in Germany. But if I went outside of Germany, there was an international arrest warrant waiting for me. And that was the situation for 16 years. So you just and stayed in Germany then, for 16 years? Yes. Wow. And then my son, who was by that time um, married and with two small children and living in Australia, fell desperately ill. He, he had a brain tumor and I knew that if I wanted to see him again, I had to go and face the Turner charge. There had been, uh, I think, seven people in that case. Everybody had been extradited except Sheila because Sheila was, had Swiss citizenship and the Swiss don't extradite their own people. And I had not been extradited, but everybody else had been extradited and they had all served time. I think they all got five years and that maybe broke down to three actual years, but they had all served time. But I knew that if I wanted to see Peter again, I had to go to America and face the music. Wow. That's a big, big, big decision. Yeah. It, I didn't make it overnight. Um, it took time. In the meantime, Peter had one operation and then another. Um, but there came the day where I knew I just had to go. And by that time, the court in America had appointed me a court attorney. That meant I, I didn't have to pay for, for an attorney, which, which would have made it impossible anyway because it's, uh, it's just too much. You don't have that kind of money. Um, but this court-appointed attorney had come to Germany in that period, and he then organized so that I could come into America, appear before the court, plead guilty, and then be allowed to go to Australia to be with Peter until I and his family until I was to return for sentencing. And that's what we did. And I have to say that in the court, when I appeared before Judge Marsh, who had been the federal court judge for the whole case from the very, very beginning, um, after I pled guilty, he looked into the courtroom and said, where is this woman's passport? And an FBI agent jumped up and said, here it is, Your Honor. And he said, give it to her. And then he looked at me and he said, we're on a trust basis from here out. And I was able to go to Australia and be with Peter for, as it turned out, four months and his family. And then I had to go back to America for sentencing. And for the charge, I could have been sentenced to um, probation or life imprisonment, anything, because it was a very serious charge. And um, Judge Marsh sentenced me to time served, which he said was the three months I'd spent in extradition custody um, in Germany years before. 
and I was free. Wow. How did you feel? It was, it was amazing. I, I, I felt as though um, I had been blessed. It was very, it felt, it felt really like a, as though I had been blessed by this man. He actually said in his, in his um, speech that he gave before sentencing, he said, in the law, we have justice and mercy. And very often, justice must take priority because it must be so. Hmm. But we have here today a case where mercy should take priority. And it, it was a blessing because Peter was still alive. And I was then able to go back to Australia and be with him to help his wife care for him at home. And he died at home with all of us there with him. Mm. It was a blessing for me. I can imagine. You've been through. You've been through so much. I. One thing that has always been very clear to me that was so important is that my parents, they waited for me. They never accused me or, or complained to me or were angry with me. They just waited. And they waited until I, come, I came home. It took 10 years until I came home. And I came from prison. So I had nothing. I'd, I'd lost everything, but they just took me in and loved me. And that gave me the strength I needed to then pick up the pieces and get on with my life. How important, then, how, how important is family to you nowadays? Hugely important. Family is everything for me. It's, it's hugely important. In fact, my mom, when my dad died at a ripe old age of 92, my mom was in Australia. She was 86. And she told my brother, take me to Jane and George. I want to live with them. <laughs> and she spent the last 10 years of her life with us. Aww. And she died with us at home, peacefully and happily. It was beautiful. Yeah. Now, family is for me, it is, uh, it's for me everything. It's what really matters. Mm. It's what really matters. Are you spiritual in any way now? Just in a very personal, private kind of way. I feel, I really feel very strongly that life takes, it means well with us. Mm -hmm. And if I look back, I see that always in an absolute crisis, when it felt as though the whole world was against me, that everything was going wrong, there was always somebody who showed up who helped me to move forward. The money came from his followers. There were the odd, very rich ones who donated freely, but by far the most of the money came from Bhagwan's followers. It was a long period while I was asking myself, what have I done? What was I thinking? How did that happen? And then there were people like, for example, the Chief Justice, who, who for me, um, here in Germany, I didn't know him. But he, he took the trouble to to examine the whole thing before he made a decision. There was Mike Rosenthal, my, my lawyer here in Germany. There was Phil Lewis, the lawyer that, that the court in, in Oregon appointed me. Phil, beautiful man. We are really good friends today. In fact, that it's funny that we're really good friends with both my, both my lawyers, my German lawyer and my American lawyer. <laughs> and Phil visited us many times and we are in close contact, yeah. Have you spoken to Sheila at all? No. I last spoke to Sheila in 1989. She was living in France at the time. She was not able to come to Germany because she had um, outstayed her visa and, and they weren't letting her in again at the time. 
And um, I was just getting my feet on the ground. I had running my juice bar. I had met George. And there came a day where I just knew it's enough now. And I went to, to France to see her and I told her, we've been through a lot, but this is it. No more money, no more phone calls, no more contact. I've got to live my life now without all this chaos. Mm. And that was the last time I spoke to her. And tell me your relationship with your daughter. It's it's wonderful. She's really a, an amazing woman. To, when I think of what she's been through, also we, we didn't touch on that, but both my children were sexually assaulted in by others, um, by older sannyasins in, in the community in Oregon. And Kali, uh, Kali for many years, my daughter. But uh, she's she's worked through things. She's married. She was sterilized when she was young because that's what people were doing. The, the money came from his followers. There were the odd, very rich ones who donated freely but by far the most of the money came from Bhagwan's followers yes at the moment he's 18 years old now <laughs> <laughs> and um, we are, we are able to talk about everything and cry about things I that should be worth having. When, when when stories like this surface I think a lot of us in, in the, out there in the the outside world look at I don't know that any form of religious cult we've seen on the news, whether that's a, a Waco with David Koresh or whatever it might be. And we kind of bunch it all together. We, we put, put it in a box and we say bad, or you've got to nuts. That's just where it goes. It's just easy to go there. General opinion can go in that, that direction. We can point the finger and say, they must be wacky or crackers that lot that have joined all that and got involved in that. Or the leader must be a bit of a nut job. But there's so much more to it. And and what you shared with me towards the beginning of this episode, I really, I really empathize with because I think it's very easy when you're vulnerable to try and find a place where you can belong and you can feel welcome and you can feel that someone's going to guide you, help you, inspire you, and, and, and generally just get you back on track into the place that you want to be. Because as human, as human beings, we, we don't typically look inside first. What we do is we look outside first to find a solution out there somewhere. And the easier the solution, the better. You know, if there's a tablet, tablet I could take to lose 10 kilos, then that's a lot easier than going to the gym and watching what I eat. It's like, well, who's got the tablet, you know? But we, we, we come to realize we've got to put some work in ourselves. But with, with this, you, you, you were vulnerable. And as much as you can look back on it now and say, you know, that was the wrong thing to do. Nine times out of 10, that's what people would do, you know? You're unhappy. Sure. Life isn't good. You know, you find somebody that exposes you to something which is a little bit better than what you've got. You do a bit more of it. And, you know, consistently it's better than what you've got. You compare it to what you had and you're like, well, this is better. And so, well, you know, you've got to be a bit dumb to stay in that place. You know, come on, come on the journey to this place because this is better. And yours, well, yours was bug one. And it doesn't matter what it is. You know, it could be the Cub Scouts, for goodness sake. It doesn't matter what it is. It's that sense of a better life, a better opportunity, a better future, belonging and significance. And that all was given to you in that environment, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. So as much as it's very easy, I'm sure, for people that are watching this right now to criticize you for getting involved in something like this, I reckon that most people in your position would have done something very, very similar. And that's why I think you're really brave to come and talk about this and be so open about it. And allow people to understand the inner workings of how you were thinking, but also the impact this had on your life, because this conversation hasn't been about everything being bad. Of course, there were bits that were bad, but it wasn't bad all the way through. And I'm glad that you had your moment where you went, this is nuts. I'm out of here. This is enough. You know, I'm glad you had that moment because I bet for sure there were many that didn't. Oh yes. There's, there are still many, many people who, although Bhagwan is long since dead, they totally believe in him and, and so on and so forth. I'm just happy that things worked out for me the way they did. And I, 
addressing what you just said about people, young people especially, that they, they come in a situation in their life where they're just not happy and, and there must be something better and where is it? I think that's part of being young. Because when you're young, you're young. You, ha you don't have a lot of life experience. You have to make it. And sometimes it's, yeah, it can be tough. And you did good. And you have, to, you have to live with so much guilt and try and process that and get through that. And I'm sure there isn't a day that goes by where you don't think about some part of that in some way. And, and that's, not, that's not easy, for sure not easy. And, you know, we skipped over... <laughs> Especially around my children. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I've got two daughters. One's 20, one's 23. They're, my eldest has just left university. My youngest is in her last year. You know, all I do is you talk to me about your kids, okay, is I think about my kids. That's, that's, that's all that happens. I go into that place of, yeah. gosh, you know, how, yeah. would, how, would my, how would my kids have reacted if that, that had been their experience, you know? You're brave. You're very brave. Jane Stork, I can't thank you enough for taking your time to come and share your story with us and to the people here in the Middle East and in Dubai today. It's been really, really interesting. And I think, as I said to you at the beginning, I feel like I already know you, but I feel like I know you really well now. And I think you're lovely. <laughs> Why, thank you, Spencer. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks thank for coming you. on the show. Good. <laughs>